in a home that was being purchased uh, for some six million dollars in Los Angeles uh, is being talked about uh, as well. And that is uh, raised uh, lots of questions. People have been saying, uh, what is the expenditure for? Well, yesterday, that was a, uh, a Zoom conference with a number of black journalists uh, with Patrice Cullors, the former leader of Black Lives Matter, former also co-founder, where she talked about this whole issue uh, along with uh, activist Angela Davis. Here is some of that conversation. As you know, I'm Patrice Cullors, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter and formerly the executive director of the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. Um, I wanna really on the top of this call kind of explain uh, just for, for 30 seconds, the, the ecosystem of Black Lives Matter. Um, there are three organizations. There's Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, which I'm the former executive director of. There's, there's a Black Lives Matter PAC uh, which endorses candidates and policy. And then there's BLM Grassroots that was really founded from the, the chapters and specifically Dr. Melina Abdullah, who's going to speak today. And I think it's really important for folks to understand the differences uh, and these um, entities as they are, they have different operations and uh, different goals. Um, same, same goal to, for Black liberation, but a uh, different take on that. And uh, Dr. Melina Abdullah is gonna speak to that. Um, so I wanna speak very directly to the recent New York Magazine article that then turned into a right-wing blitz um, and just set the record straight. So it's really important for folks to understand that the acquiring of the multi-purpose property happened in October of 2020. Um, for us, it was a huge accomplishment, and I'm speaking specifically to Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. Um, despite what has been reported, um, it was uh, BLM has not been financially solvent. Um, you know, our money really did come in 2020, um, and it was really important for us to do a number of things. One, get that money to the ground um, and get that get those resources to the ground, which we did. Uh, but also secure uh, a space like so many other organizations, um, not just across Black movement, but across nonprofit organizations do. Um, we uh, found the place and we hired Dane Pascal, who is a known uh, Black real estate consultant um, here in Los Angeles and across the country. He's made similar, he's done, he's facilitated similar processes with other organizations like Community Services Unlimited, uh, which is actually an organization that was founded by the Panther Party here in Los Angeles. And they have a space uh, that they were able to um, purchase. And so Dane was a, a, a natural um, facilitator for this process. Um, this purchase was made six months prior to my resignation. And uh, the property was uh, uh, needed some renovations, um, like most properties do. We hired a management company to help get the property together for public use. But almost immediately upon closing uh, the attacks on me and BLM, uh, which also means on Molina and others, escalated. Uh, so we did use the campus as a haven, um, as a, a safe place. Uh, and it derailed an announcement strategy. Uh, it wasn't a secret, uh, conditions changed and that's it. Um, as you all know, and you've seen BLM, uh, the organization, but also many of the leaders are under constant surveillance. There's serious security issues. Um, I was called by the first FBI one. twice, but the first time I was called uh, by the FBI to tell me that there was a credible threat against my life. I did stay in the, uh, property for four nights. Um, and that's it. I stayed there for four nights while the FBI was um, doing their work to try to figure out uh, who the what was happening with the credible threat. Uh, and once I resigned, I never visited the property again. Haven't been there. Now, uh, Angela Davis, she also spoke uh, at uh, on this call as well. Here is some of what she had to say. Now, this is a very uh, difficult moment. It is a, um, a, a moment that can produce an enormous amount of possibility. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we see um, conservative efforts to turn the clock back to discredit uh, 
the, the, the movement to um, uh, pretend as if it uh, uh, might be possible uh, to live life as we have uh, previously experienced it. I'm referring to the fact that uh, from the White House, we have heard calls for more police, uh, and 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 we've heard efforts to um, discredit the the progress, at least the ideological progress that we have uh, made uh, since the advent of Black Lives Matter. Uh, uh, I uh, personally knew from the outset. Uh, uh, from 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 the time Black Lives Matter was created, that there would be um, um, attacks similar to the historical attacks launched against uh, black uh, black leaders. Uh, uh, you know, particularly when we saw the FBI come up with this notion of black identity extremists. Uh, this was a sign that there was continuity uh, uh, with COINTELPRO. Uh, 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 I um, I can't say that uh, uh, I would have predicted exactly how these attacks would express themselves, uh, 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 but um, I, I I was convinced that they would happen. Uh, you know, whether you're talking about attacks on. All right, folks, let's talk about our panel: Mustafa, Lauren, as well as Teresa. Uh, Lauren, here is the most fundamental issue. One, uh, I encouraged on this show, uh, publicly and privately, for uh, Patrice and the folks involved to actually do this call to say it needed to happen, you need to talk to black journalists. That did happen. But here's the problem. She left May of last year. She's no longer with Black Lives Matter. And I've communicated to the existing leaders of Black Lives Matter, where are y'all? Why are you not talking? Why are you not out here explaining what's going on? I was sent um, an actual story uh, from that's on, on News One, um, where they label an exclusive explaining uh, what the, um, the house uh, is for. I saw that and I got it, but 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 still, and, and I understand they're sitting here getting all of these uh, various hits. Uh, they got people uh, who are attacking them. But the former leader of Black Lives Matter cannot be the one, Lauren, who's out talking about what's happening now. It has to be the existing leadership who's doing it. Yeah, absolutely it has to be the existing leadership who's doing it. And they do have to have some sort of accounting that the media can in some way evaluate for... $90 million that was, I believe, raised in, in 2020 uh, after the death of George Floyd. Uh, you know, all this talk that we've heard from Black Lives Matter in the past about not having leadership, a specific leader, and, you know, wow, everybody's a leader and all that. that at some point, that has to come to an end because someone, of course, has to lead with regard to where the money allocation is going. Uh, and I'm not sure why. I, I mean, I do. I understand, you know, that obviously $90 million is a lot of money, and I understand why that could get complicated. But in terms of large purchases of any type, it should be fairly easy to demonstrate to journalists what those large purchases are, you know, um, and what the general focus of their, you know, monetary situation is. Because as they should have, I'm sure, have figured out by now. Uh, you know, the New York Post and right-wing media is completely invested in, in some way, disenfranchising and damage, damaging a very powerful movement of Black Lives Matter. I mean, that is what they are invested in. Now the story, of course, went from right-wing media, as it typically does, to what I would consider to be mainstream media, uh, starting with the New York, uh, New York Magazine. And now, all of a sudden, there's a column in the Washington Post. Well, of course there is, because... That's how right-wing media pushes something into the mainstream. And now you see, you know, a column in the Washington Post about this. But the way they should answer this is very directly in, and in detail about their accounting. Because the movement is very, you know, it's obviously too important to be damaged by this type of thing. Uh, and um, some of these criticisms, some of the criticisms that they get from, from grassroots leaders, particularly those in Ferguson, on the ground, I think are fairly valid. I mean, this is a movement that has made a substantial amount of money 
uh, in 20, uh, 2020 when George Floyd, after George Floyd was murdered. So you have a movement making a lot of money off of the death of a black male. And so the question is, how is that money being allocated? What is that money being allocated for? And we talk about police brutality. That is something that disproportionately impacts right. black men. So I think they have to have that entire discussion. Somebody should have that that discussion at well, some point. Well, bottom line is you gotta uh, again you gotta step up. I I'm gonna show these tweets here. So they sent these tweets out yesterday, folks. Uh, and so look at this here. Uh, pull them up, please, on, on the television. Uh, they said black creativity is necessary and vital to black survival. BLM has always held that tradition sacred, partnering with artists of every kind since our founding. That's why Creator's House was purchased to provide a space for black folks to share their gifts with the world and hone their craft as they see fit under the conditions that work best for them and outside systems of oppression in creative industries. Over the last several months, BLM GNF, that's the Global uh, Foundation, has provided $3 million in direct support to families struggling to navigate the impact of COVID. They said, uh, we have granted uh, over $25 million to black-led frontline orgs around the world. Then they also tweeted, the organization provided investments to orgs run by families impacted by police violence. We work with BLM grassroots to collect 60,000 signatures in support of Andrew Joseph to end qualified immunity. Uh, and we'll work to build support among policymakers for federal legislation like the Breathe Act and the People's Response Act. Uh, then they also say, uh, that, uh, let's see here, we demanded a full investigation after the attempted coup on January 6th. They laid that out. Then they also uh, talked about uh, the Black Futures Month uh, concert that took place. And then they also tweeted, we're embracing this moment as an opportunity for accountability, healing, truth-telling, and transparency. We understand the necessity of working intentionally to rebuild trust so we continue forging a new path that sustains black people for generations. And then that is uh, the last tweet there. You see that was sent out again at 9.15 a.m. Uh, on, uh, first of all, it's April 11th. Uh, 2022. Here, Teresa, your communication strategist, here is the whole problem. Why in the hell are we seeing these tweets uh, a year, almost a year after uh, P Patrice Cullors left in May? This is what should have been sent out in June or July or August or September or October or November or December or January, February, March, April. You, it should not be sent out in response to conservative attacks. That's what you send out to preempt those type of attacks. You know they're going to come after you uh, for the money. I've talked to people on the inside there. They're trying to deal with the communication apparatus. What you also are dealing with is you have a, 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 a fundamental problem with their hierarchy. Who in the hell is leading the organization? Who is the executive director? Who's the deputy executive right. director? Who's the head of finance? Who's the head of IT? And I get their point that many of their leaders have come under attack and have been targeted by hate folks. But the reality is this here. If you are over a nonprofit, you are a public entity. You can't be anonymous sitting over a nonprofit. You got to have the right. information. They've got to be able to anticipate these type of questions. You can't do it by being quiet and hoping Patrice can somehow take all the hits or Alicia Garza can take all the hits. They are no longer involved with BLM. The folks there now, they must do it. You're absolutely right. And it actually does a disservice to the public, you know, when um, the senior leadership decides not to speak um, on crucial issues after raising $90 million um, for their organization to combat some of these injustices that we are still dealing with every day. It is almost uh, just heartbreaking, um, to say the least, that the organization infrastructure was not in place once she left. Um, I think pe you're absolutely right. People absolutely wanted to leave the scene and wanted to try something different. But again, if there was no strategy, no leadership, there was no way that BLM could uh, meet its full potential. Um, if anything, uh, monies, you know, were na that now questioned um, in the hands of this uh, nuanced global leadership. But I think they're they're now seeing the, the destruction that is happening, and I believe they are now on the right path to getting their uh, house in order per se, versus not saying anything at all. So I mean, I'm I'm glad something has been led, but I hope that the new leadership is also taking a lesson um, and making sure that it's learned for uh, future 
um, uh, opportunities. But the right absolutely saw the same thing you just named, Roland, where there was a lack of leadership, there was a lack of responsibility, there was a lack of transparency. And so when they saw that there was a lack of narrative in the messaging in order to uh, explain themselves, they absolutely did what they were... Uh, that their agenda is, which is to, um, you know, deconstruct um, an organization that is uh, that is combating racism at every hand. Um, and and yeah, there we go. And Mustafa, look, this is real simple. The moment they came out announcing the money, somebody should have said before they announced it, we better be able to articulate what we're doing with it. I've been told the NAACP actually raised almost $140 million after the death of George Floyd. That's more than Black Lives Matter. I've been told the National Urban League has raised... Uh, I've been told anywhere from 50 to $80 million. All, all black groups uh, were able, saw increases at the death of George Floyd. BLM was the only one that actually put, put their figure out. So let's also be, be, be clear. They're transparent. Other groups that got money, they ain't said a word. But the deal is, if you spend $6 million on a house, you damn sure better tell folk when you do it, you don't announce a year later, oh, we have a home for creators uh, or whatever. No, you got to be able to say that. And if the home is also a refuge for people uh, who are under attack, I get that as well. But again, you have to be able to anticipate the level of attacks because the right wing will love nothing more than sow seeds of discontent, take them out. And let me also say this here, why also I push them to talk to black media because part of the problem, and I saw this in the last several years, a whole bunch of these black groups step out of there and do stuff and they run the white media to give them the, uh, the, uh, give them the exclusives and then when they get their ass kicked, they want to call us to bail them out. No, you call me on the front end and the back end. And so that's what also is important because the problem is a lot of black folks, they, they, especially a lot of these so-called black media outlets, they see something being reported in mainstream media and they just run with it, never ask the question, hmm, what's the real story here? That also has to happen. You know, my auntie always says, put it on front street. That way can nobody say that they didn't know, um, that they weren't informed. Um, and that hopefully they were a part of the process. We know so many folks were a part of supporting Black Lives Matter, been doing incredible work since 2014. Um, so it is a part of the narrative. You know, the narrative, as was shared in those tweets, are critically important. But you also got to make sure you have the infrastructure, transparency, and accountability for any organization to be successful because you know you're going to have haters. Haters going to come, and you got to be prepared for them. All right, folks, back to our Mark unfiltered video in just one moment. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. A real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> I support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?